A blessed Aldersgate Sunday to all of us, wherever we are. And may the peace of the Lord, which passes all human understanding, may it strengthen our hearts and minds as we all press on during this difficult period of the pandemic. I felt my heart strangely warmed. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, used this phrase to describe his spiritual encounter with God on the evening of May the 24th, 1738. That spiritual heartwarming experience took place in a small group gathering somewhere along Aldersgate Street in London. Methodists celebrate May the 24th every year as Aldersgate Day. We are a people called Methodists. And I'm very happy to be called a Methodist. But what is a Methodist? John Wesley gave us his answer in one of his sermons entitled, The Character of a Methodist. He listed several characteristics of a Methodist and then said, and here I paraphrase, if you should say why these characteristics which you have listed are only the common fundamental principles of all Christianity, I reply, indeed, this is the truth. I know they are. And I would to God that you and everyone would also know that I and all who, like me, are called Methodists do vehemently refuse to be distinguished from anybody by anything but common principles of all Christianity. I preach the plain old Christianity, renouncing and detesting all other marks of distinction. These are very strong words. I would to God that you and everyone would also know that I and all who like me are called Methodists do vehemently refuse to be distinguished from anybody by anything but the common principles of all Christianity. In other words, John Wesley wanted Methodists to insist that there is fundamentally nothing special in being Methodists, which might distinguish them from all true Christian disciples. So let me say again that I am very happy to be called a Methodist, but like John Wesley, I hope that Methodists in Singapore will vehemently refuse to be distinguished from anybody by anything but the common principles of all who are disciples of Jesus Christ. But what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Now, there are different ways one might answer that question. My favorite answer is plain and simple. A disciple of Jesus Christ is someone is, who is committed to what Jesus Christ says is the greatest, most important thing in life. Love God with all your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself. John Wesley believed this to be the most important thing in life as well. Here is what he told his students and preachers. All that you teach should contain in it somewhere love towards God and love towards mankind. Make sure that this theme underlies all your lectures. Every Methodist pastor at their ordination since John Wesley's day has been asked this most important question about love for God and neighbor. Are you going on to perfection? Do you expect to be made perfect in love in this life? And what did Wesley mean by perfection? Here is Wesley's definition. By perfection, I mean the love of God and our neighbor ruling our tempers, words, and actions. I suspect that Mr. Wesley would desire all Methodists, not just ordained Methodist pastors, but all Methodists to take this vow. And not just Methodists, but all who call themselves Christians. To follow that which Jesus Christ himself says is the most important commandment in life and all scripture to love God with all our heart and to love our neighbor as ourselves. This is what it means to be a Methodist. 
This is what it means to be a Christian. This love for God and love for neighbor is also a central theme in the writing of John. Not John Wesley, but John the Apostle. Listen again to verses 20 and 21 of John's letter. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. John here speaks of brothers and sisters rather than neighbors, but the point is the same. Love for God and love for our brother or neighbor are, in God's eyes, virtually the same commandment. Jesus also made this point when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment in all of the Bible? And Jesus answered, the first commandment is to love God with all your heart. And the second commandment is just like the first one. Notice Jesus did not say the second commandment comes in a very close second to the first commandment. No. Jesus did not say the second commandment is almost as important as the first one. No. Jesus said the second commandment is just like the first one. In other words, to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself are, in Jesus' opinion, similar commandments. The Apostle Paul also understood Jesus clearly. When Paul writes to tell us which single commandment best summarizes the entire law of God, Paul says, love your neighbor as yourself. What? You object. How could Paul say that? Doesn't Paul know that the first commandment is the command to love God with all our heart? Why does Paul cite the second most important commandment rather than the first? Why? Because Paul understood Jesus correctly. And Jesus said that the second is just like the first. The two commandments are the same. So Paul could also have written that the entire law is summed up in the command to love God with all your heart. But Paul wanted to stress the practical expression of loving God by loving our neighbors. And so he simply cites the second commandment as his summary emphasis. This is also what the Apostle John emphasizes in our Bible reading today. Look again at verse 12. John is very direct. God is invisible. No one has ever seen God with their physical eyes. So how can we love someone whom we cannot see? John answers in verses 20 to 21. We love the God whom we cannot see by loving our neighbors who we can see. Whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. So love God and love your neighbor. Our Lord Jesus connects these two commands by saying that they are just like each other. The Apostle Paul connects them by saying that all God's commands are fulfilled by loving our neighbor. The Apostle John connects the two by saying, we are not loving God if we are not loving our neighbor. I like to connect the two in the phrase, let us love God by loving our neighbor. Please, we must not understand this command to love our neighbor as a threat. Look at what John says in verse 18 about love that is perfect. Perfect love drives out all fear of judgment or punishment. In other words, our motivation for loving God and loving our neighbor is not because we are afraid of God's punishment or judgment against us if we do not love. No, God wants our love for God and neighbor to be motivated not by any fear of punishment. Perfect love is freely given, not fearfully given. 
This freedom from the fear of God's punishment was a part of the heartwarming experience of John Wesley at Aldersgate. Wesley writes, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that God had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. It's hard to be certain. Wesley scholars disagree. So we'll have to wait till we meet Wesley in heaven to check exactly what he meant. But it does sound as if Wesley was saying that before his Aldersgate heartwarming experience, he was not 100% sure whether he truly trusted in Christ's love and assurance of salvation. Not sure whether he had loved God and loved his neighbors enough to save his soul. But that Aldersgate evening, I felt my heart strangely warm. I felt I did trust in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. The Apostle John also wants John Wesley's experience for each of us. Verse 16 almost sounds like Wesley's Aldersgate testimony. John writes, And so we know and we rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. John writes, We don't just know in our head that God loves us. We really believe it. We rely on it. We trust that this is really true. We rely on this promise that God loves us. Both John Wesley and John the Apostle want us to truly know and truly believe that God loves us, that our sins, yes, even my sins and your sins, they are forgiven and taken away. Thanks be to God. So now we can love our neighbors freely, without the fear of wondering whether we have done enough or loved enough to be saved from God's punishment. God wants us to be perfected in love. And perfect love is love without fear of punishment. Let me paraphrase what the Apostle John has been saying about perfect love. Firstly, perfect love is loving God by loving our neighbors. Secondly, perfect love is love without fear of God's judgment. Perfect love drives out all fear of punishment. And now thirdly, perfect love is love out of the love of God that is inside of us. Love that comes out of God's love. We love because God is love and God's love is within us. Look at verse 12. No one has ever seen God, but God lives in us and his love is made complete or perfect in us. Complete is the same word that he used in verses 17 and 18 describing perfect or complete love. John is urging us to love our neighbors, not out of fear of God's punishment, but to love them out of God's love, which is inside us. Both John Wesley's testimony and the Apostle John's letter here focuses on this internal experience and truth of God's love. I felt my heart strangely warmed. God's love made perfect inside us. Verse 16 reinforces the point. We know and also believe in the love of God inside us. Now, I know most of our English translations simply say, we know and believe in the love God has for us. Well, John certainly believes in the love that God has for us. But John here writes, we know and believe in the love that God has in us, not just for us. He uses the same Greek preposition that he has been using in this whole paragraph. God lives in us. His love is perfected in us. We abide in God and God abides in us. And so we know 
and not just know, we believe in our hearts that the love of God is in us. And when, like John Wesley, our hearts are strangely warmed, then we too begin truly to know and rely on the love of God that is within us. And also like Wesley, God's love will then spread from within us to our neighbors outside us. We love because God has first put his love within us. As Methodists and as disciples of Christ, let us pray for perfect love. Let us love God by loving our neighbors, not out of fear, but out of the love which God has put inside us. Love flowing out of hearts that have been strangely warmed. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. There are so many different ways every day in which we can love God by loving our neighbors. And another Christian principle which John Wesley emphasized was to love God not just as a solitary individual, but as a small group. We don't just tell each individual Christian to love God by loving their neighbor. No, we help each other love God by loving our neighbors together. Mary is one of many neighbors in our MWS nursing homes who longs for love. Your small group could adopt Mary by taking turns in twos or threes to visit and chat with her. She can become your adopted auntie. Our MWS chaplains will happily welcome your small group for a short visit, give you basic instructions on how to conduct a meaningful bedside visit, and then introduce you to a Mary or Larry in their rooms. Think about it. If members of your small group take turns in groups of two or three, each team of two visiting just once a month for 15 minutes, this will provide for your adopted Uncle Larry or Auntie Mary a very much appreciated once-a-week visit from somebody in your small group. Please get in touch with our MWS chaplains. You can leave a message for them on the MWS website or you can call the main telephone line. I am sure that they will tell you that your group's weekly 15-minute visit is not something that is superficial or, or insignificant. No, it may seem that 15 minutes is very superficial for us, but many, if not all, of the long-term aunties and uncles in their beds would look forward to your visits. And for them, it may well be their most significant heartwarming experience of the week. Let's love God together by loving our neighbors together. Nursing homes is one way. Fostering homes is another. Eight-year-old Caleb is a young neighbor who wanted to be welcomed into a loving foster home. Watch this true story of how Caleb's heart is strangely warmed by receiving God's love, not just from an individual, but from a Methodist small group who love God together by loving Caleb together. Hi, my name is Caleb. I am turning nine soon. Whenever I'm lonely or scared, I look for my best friend, Peter Rabbit. Auntie Lipe gave him to me when I joined her family. My mummy and daddy cannot take care of me now, so Auntie Lipe said her family and Peter Rabbit will take care of me. Look, here he is! Peter Rabbit makes me feel safe. Peter Rabbit and I have many friends from church. Let me show you. Hi, Caleb. Wow, what is this? Peter Rabbit, is he your best? This is Auntie Lorraine. Sometimes when Auntie Leaping and Uncle Joseph are busy at work, she picks me up from school. Good job, Caleb. Okay, come, let's go. 
Okay, look. Look what I got for you. Blackpinks! Yay! I was scared when I met Auntie Lorraine for the first time. But now she is a cool auntie. Here you go, Auntie Lorraine. <laughs> Hi Caleb, welcome to Play Therapy today. Oh, hi. Once a week, I bring Peter Rabbit to Auntie Grace. The big dino is mean and the small dino is scared. The small dino is scared? What else is he feeling? When scary things happen in my life, Auntie Grace calms me down and then my feeling becomes smaller. I like Auntie Grace. Caleb, which snack would you like? Pokey. This is Uncle Ming Yao. I want to bring for Samuel Titi. Would you like me to pack this for Samuel Titi? Oh, that's very nice of you. I'll put this in. I am going to his house for a sleepover today. How about Peter Rabbit? Would you like to bring? My heart feels happy when we all play together. Sometimes Auntie Li Ping is angry. This is the seventh or eighth time you tried to hide your homework from me. When are you going to be honest with me? I know this has been hard for you. Sometimes Auntie Li Ping is sad. I think it's because of me. We'll get through this together. Caleb, I'm sorry I'm so harsh with you just now. But can you try to be honest with me? Can I give you a hug? I'm sorry, Auntie Li Ping. Happy birthday to Caleb. Happy birthday to you. Yay! Make a wish, Caleb. I hope I can be friends with Auntie Lauren, Auntie Grace, and Uncle Ming Yao forever. I am happy that I'm not lonely anymore. Peter Rabbit and I have many friends that take care of us. I am gonna play with them now. Bye bye! Some of our Christian brothers and sisters are passionate about helping young children find a fostering family. They are running a Zoom session next month. They will happily answer any questions you might have on what is involved in fostering, for how long does it last. Here is a QR code or a link to that Zoom meeting. This may be one way that your small group loves God together by loving a young neighbor together. I felt my heart strangely warmed. May our hearts and the hearts of many, many more neighbors be strangely warmed as we love God together by loving our neighbors together. Amen. Let's pray together. Perfect love casts out fear. Father, we love because you love us and you have put your love in us. Help us to love you with hearts strangely warmed by loving our neighbors as ourselves. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who first loved us. Amen.